you spent seven years in prison. More than seven. So seven and a half the last time. Twelve all total. Twelve total. Seven and a half the last time. So you so you went you were in prison twice. I speak in prisons all the time, Roland. You know, all, all over the country, and, and and it's getting more difficult because of the amount of time they're handing these young African American Latino men. You want to get attracted to stuff that's good, right? You know, you can go do some for a million dollars, you know what I mean? Some dumb stuff for a million dollars, they pay you to do that. Charles S. Dutton, the legendary actor who graced our screens in iconic roles, has just dropped a shocking revelation about why he really walked away from the glitz and glamour. Sometimes you get distracted because they pay you to do Right. And it seems like it's juicier than anyone could have imagined. Forget what you thought you knew. Dutton's reason for quitting Hollywood isn't just a personal decision. It's a scandalous twist that shakes the very foundation of Tinseltown. And uh, so it, it takes you back to the reason you want to be an actor. So let's get into it. Recently, there's been some buzz about the legendary Charles Stanley Dutton. You know, the guy who kickstarted his Hollywood career while he was in prison. Lately, he's been flying under the radar, which has got people talking. Word on the street is that he stepped back from the industry for a bit, and now rumors are swirling that he might be gearing up to spill the beans on why. Let's dive into this drama and see what's up. Sometimes you get distracted because they pay you to do Right. <laughs> you know? And uh, so it, it takes you back to the reason you want to be an actor. Right. Charles Stanley Dutton was born on January 30th, 1951, on the east side of Baltimore, Maryland. Life wasn't easy from the beginning. His father worked as a trucker, and his parents split up when he was just four years old. He grew up in Baltimore's Latrobe Homes public housing project. School didn't hold his interest, so he left before finishing middle school. Instead, he pursued boxing for a while, earning the nickname Rock, short for for Rockhead, derived from the rock throwing contests he participated in as a child. Hey, look, if you came for the meeting, it's over. Everybody left. Yeah, well, we are here for the meeting. Parenthetically. <laughs> What? At the age of 16 in 1967, Charles Stanley Dutton faced a life-changing event when he was involved in a deadly altercation. According to Dutton, the other person attacked him with a knife, escalating the situation. Dutton has been candid about his turbulent past, acknowledging that he used to take pleasure in physical altercations and violence. His childhood antics, including rock fights that left him battered and bloodied, earned him the nickname Rockhead. As he pursued amateur boxing, this moniker was shortened to Rock. During the incident at age 16, Dutton was stabbed seven times by his assailant. Despite the severity of the situation, Dutton fought back and managed to disarm his attacker, ultimately leaving the other individual injured on the street. 20, 30, you know, 40, with, 50 Without years. parole, you know, that's the thing too, without parole. The federal system, there is no parole in the federal system. Following the knife altercation, Dutton took responsibility for his actions and pleaded guilty to manslaughter in 1967. He was sentenced to five years in prison, beginning at the Maryland House of Correction and Jessup. However, his freedom was short-lived. After being on parole for about a year and a half, he was arrested again, this time for robbery and illegal possession of a firearm. The judge imposed a harsh sentence for the gun charge, sending him back to prison, this time to the Maryland Penitentiary, which was not far from his childhood home, for an additional three years. In my day, 35, 40 years ago, most states were spending tens of millions in those days on rehabilitation. But those days are over with. Dutton's turbulent nature persisted during his second prison term. He proudly identified as a troublemaker, always prepared to confront guards and fellow inmates, drawing on his boxing skills from his youth. One memorable incident involved a clash with a guard who denied him a visitation. Dutton, fueled by anger and determination, challenged the guard to a physical confrontation. Locked in a room, the two exchanged punches for what Dutton later described as a wonderful, nice 10 minutes busting each other up. Reflecting on the disparities in sentencing based on race. Dutton remarked, I got three years for K-ing a black man and eight for punching a white man. Life in prison was far from easy. Dutton was stabbed by another inmate and narrowly escaped death. It was during this period that he became involved in radical movements like the Black Panther Party. During a six-day stint in solitary confinement for refusing to clean toilets, Dutton's life took a pivotal turn. Allowed one book, he chose an anthology of black playwrights on a whim. This choice transformed his perspective. Upon his release from solitary, Dutton approached the warden with a proposal to start a drama group for the Winter Talent Show. The warden agreed, but with a condition. Dutton had to obtain his GED. Rising to the challenge, Dutton earned his GED and completed a two-year college program at Hagerstown Junior College, graduating with an Associate of Arts degree in 1976. 
This marked a turning point in Dutton's life, paving the way for his future in acting and directing. So it's hard to go into a federal prison and tell a guy, get your GED, when he's got 80 years without the possibility of parole, which means he'll do 74. Mm. years. On August 20th, 1976, Dutton was granted parole. Immediately after leaving prison, he pursued his passion for acting by enrolling as a drama major at Towson State University in the suburbs of Baltimore. He completed his Bachelor of Arts degree in 1978 and continued his education by earning a master's degree in acting from the renowned Yale School of Drama in 1983. It's about perseverance, it's about discipline, and endure it. Dutton's golden period began in 1984 when he made his Broadway debut in August Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. His performance was exceptional, earning him a Theatre World Award and a Tony Award nomination for Best Actor. Following this success, Dutton ventured into Hollywood, portraying Leroy Brown in Crocodile Dundee 2 in 1988 and delivering a compelling performance in the TV miniseries The M of Mary Fagan, where he starred alongside luminaries like Jack Lemmon and Kevin Spacey. He continued to build Build on his achievements, receiving another Best Actor Tony nomination in 1990 for his role in yet another August Wilson play, The Piano Lesson. Dutton's career expanded further with notable roles in films such as Alien 3, which marked director David Fincher's debut feature, as well as memorable performances in Rudy, Get on the Bus, and A Time to K. Oh, hell! Doka got some of this good whiskey! Yeah. Don't give Lama none of this! Dutton's versatility knows no bounds. He is showcased his talent across various genres, excelling in both drama and comedy. His exceptional performances earned him Outstanding Guest Actor Emmy Awards in 2002 and 2003 for his appearances in The Practice and Without a Trace. Prior to these wins, he had already garnered attention with a nomination in 1999 for his role in the HBO prison drama Oz, where he also received an NAACP Image Award nomination. You know, you gotta be a little lucky, you know, a little destined, but as Dennis said, you know, you got to have some material to offer. And let's not forget his turn as the mayor of New York City in the 1999 flick Aftershock, Earthquake in New York. But perhaps one of his most memorable roles was in the comedy series Rock, which aired on Fox but was produced by HBO. It ran from 91 to 94 and earned him yet another NAACP Image Award. He even dabbled in sci-fi with the 2005 CBS series Threshold, although it didn't quite go the distance. But this did not stop him. In 2000, Dutton took the helm as director for the HBO miniseries the Corner, a project that hit close to home for him since he grew up in the streets of East Baltimore. Adapted from the book The Corner, a year in the life of an inner-city neighborhood by David Simon and Ed Burns, both familiar faces in Baltimore, the miniseries scored big at the Emmys, snagging the title of Best Miniseries, with Dutton himself clinching an award for his direction. I'm Charles S. Dutton. Last summer, I came back here to Baltimore, Maryland, the film a story about life on the corner. The corner presented unique challenges, particularly in its portrayal of the turbulent lives of 15-year-old DeAndre McCullough, played by Sean Nelson, and his parents, Fran Boyd, portrayed by Condi Alexander, and Gary McCullough, played by T.K. Carter. The film delves into their downward spiral into despair with unflinching realism, capturing the raw essence of the book amid its bleakness, delusions, and degradation. The script, written by David Simon, a former Baltimore Sun reporter and David Mills, a former Washington Post writer, provided a compelling foundation for Dutton's directorial vision. Filmed against the backdrop of East Baltimore's desolate row house landscape, with key scenes set at the actual corner of Monroe and West Fayette streets on the west side of town, the corner held profound geographical and emotional significance for Dutton. Much of the series was shot just a mile away from the housing project where he grew up, close to the looming walls of the Maryland State Penitentiary. This proximity added a point layer of authenticity to Dutton's portrayal of the harsh realities depicted in the series. I grew up and hung out on a corner just like this one, not too far from here. A corner like thousands of others across the country. It's the place to go if you want to be seen and to a lot of folks. The production of The Corner was a case of art imitating life, with real-life dangers looming over the cast and crew. Filming disrupted the usual haunts of D-dealers, sparking dangerous turf wars among rivals. Dutton and Simon found themselves in the precarious position of mediating these conflicts, with Simon even going as far as apologizing to the dealers for the disturbance caused by the production. It was a stark reminder of the harsh realities that the series sought to portray. The contradiction of it is on one hand, 
the corner pulsates with life, the energy of human beings trying to make it to the next day. As Dutton delved deeper into his role and the production of The Corner, echoes from his past kept resurfacing. A woman he had once mentored in a literacy program during her childhood visited the set, now a crack-addicted S-worker. Memories flooded back as two of the 12 men who had been part of a prison drama company with Dutton 25 years prior showed up, their lives marked by tragedy. Some deceased, others still behind bars or lost to addiction. The haunting connections didn't stop there. A young local actor cast by Dutton to portray a D-dealer who stabs a customer, met a tragic end himself. Just a month after filming wrapped up, he was stabbed to death on the unforgiving streets. These encounters served as stark reminders of the harsh realities that permeated both the show's storyline and the lives of those involved in its production. This became personal for me, Dutton says. Because of my life and my past, I was always equated with some kind of expert on this subject, which I very well might be. Similar to the characters depicted in The Corner, Dutton had his own history History with D. He doesn't shy away from admitting it, recalling the various substances he experimented with, including C, LSD, M, opium, hashish, and H. However, he's quick to draw a distinction. He never considered himself an addict. Instead, Dutton acknowledges that his true craving lay elsewhere, in violence. His nickname, stemming from childhood rock battles, persisted as he transitioned into amateur boxing. You want to know who got the good drugs? You want to know who got last night and why and who did it? You come here. However, people were quick enough to speculate that maybe he was deliberately induced to the D use so that he can be eliminated from the industry. One of his fans wrote, I love Charles Dutton in everything he acted in. He's so talented. I cannot believe they won't put him and his talented self on TV. I and my family never issued a segment of rock. I never missed a movie he acted in. And yes, he's underrated. He's a very good actor. And we, his fans, are missing him on all screens. Miss and love you. Charles Dutton. Another one added, What's new? Controlling black stories has always been the norm. 99% of black shows have white writers, producers, etc. One more person added, You can't hide the truth and the injustice of our people. The more you hide the truth, the more it will resurface. United we stand. And sources suggest that it might be possible that due to his D intake, he may have adopted the violent nature. As he himself said, I enjoyed knocking the expletive out of people, he says merrily. I wasn't a bully. I would have been dead if I had been. But I enjoyed violence. Or maybe due to his family issues? Dutton's upbringing was marked by the separation of his parents when he was just four years old. Raised by his mother, who worked tirelessly cleaning houses, she instilled in him a sense of pride and self-reliance. Despite facing financial struggles, she steadfastly refused to accept welfare assistance to support her three children. Dutton's conservative views and disdain for government programs and his violent nature may well stem from his mother's strong stance on self-sufficiency and her pride in providing for her family without relying on external aid. And parents, we must take responsibility. You know, we have to take our children back and gain control. It is our individual responsibility to do this. We'll talk Talking about the change Dutton, Dutton's knack for gripping performances wasn't just limited to the big screen. He took on the role of Montgomery County Police Chief Charles Moose in the 2003 made-for-TV flick DC Sniper, 23 Days of Fear, and popped up in season two of The L Word. Fans of The Sopranos might remember him from the episode Another Toothpick. He also made a guest appearance on House MD as the dad of Dr. Eric Foreman, played by Omar Epps, and he had roles in First Time Felon and Sleeper Cell, American Terror, where he also directed a couple of episodes. What about a great leader? What are you going to do while we tore the way for Jihad? HBO recognized his talent, striking a deal in 2007 for Dutton to develop, direct, and star in series and movies for the network. That same year, he showed up in the film Honey Dripper. In 2013, he returned to the small screen with the TV series Zero Hour, playing a priest. He also took on the role of Detective Margolis in the horror flick The Monkey's Paw. Plus, he scored a spot in Randall Miller's Midnight Rider, a biopic about Greg Allman, in 2014. I was a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Core. After four years. Dutton's turnaround wasn't a snap decision. It was a slow, steady climb out of the abyss of prison life. Reflecting on his past, he reckons he spent close to a decade locked away, including time in reform school. His most recent taste of freedom came 13 years back when he walked out of Maryland State Penitentiary, finally paroled after a string of convictions. A couple of things happened that saved him, he said, over an iced tea on the porch of the show Busy Off Fine Cafe in Hollywood. Dutton dapper in black and white wingtipped shoes and a black and white speckled sports 
sports jacket, was suddenly talking as fast as his character Boy Willie in Piano Lesson. And that's fast. I've never done anything I've been ashamed of, he said. I never hurt anybody who wasn't trying to hurt me. But I was wrongheaded, that's for sure. I quit school in the seventh grade. I thought there was more happening on the corner. In my neighborhood in Baltimore, you were expected to go to prison. It was a given, like some kids expect to go to college. I was a tough guy in prison. I was involved with the Panthers and the leftist movement. I considered myself a political prisoner. I was a knucklehead. I adapted to prison life, but I wasn't conditioned by it. I didn't decorate my cell. Dutton's redemption wasn't some divine revelation, but it was definitely dramatic. In 1972, a buddy on the outside sent him a play called Day of Absence by Douglas Turner Ward. It was about a day in a southern town where all the black folks vanished, leaving the whites stranded. It's isolation for six days and you're allowed to take one book. I accidentally picked up an anthology of black playwrights. Dutton decided to stage the play with some fellow inmates and even set up a drama workshop. It was like a light bulb went off in his head. Suddenly, hanging with his hardcore prison pals felt outdated, but trouble had a way of finding him. One day, a rival inmate sneaked up behind Dutton and stabbed him in the neck, putting him in the hospital for two months. It was a wake-up call. Dutton made a promise to himself. If I live through this, I'm done with this world of stupidity. And true to his word, he turned his life around. He got his community college degree behind bars, got paroled, and went on to earn a BA from Towson State University in 78. A professor there encouraged him to apply for a drama scholarship at Yale, jokingly saying, with all the bleeding hearts at Yale, you're sure to get in. Dutton's timing couldn't have been better. His application landed at Yale just as Lloyd Richards took the reins of the drama department. And that's when the magic started. Richards, along with his protege, the legendary playwright August Wilson, formed a powerhouse trio with Dutton. Richards drafted him for roles in the Yale Repertory Theater. Wilson selected him for his Broadway debut in Wilson's Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, a production that resulted in Dutton's first Tony Award nomination. They teamed up for productions of Wilson's iconic plays like Ma Rainey, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, and The Piano Lesson. Dutton understood the delicate balance in Wilson's work. He noted, every Wilson play has that fine line between laughter and serious drama. As an actor, if you lean too much into the comedy, you can't come back. Especially with a black audience, there's a risk they'll draw you into the comedy. There's a thin line between the reality of the character and just playing it for laughs. If you go too far, you lose the essence of the play. The play has been evolving since its debut in Boston. In the beginning, I was rushing through my lines, Dutton explained. I felt like my character was too similar to Levy, the trumpet player in Ma Rainey. But Boy Willie is different. He doesn't have that same violent streak and he's a country guy. Levy's more of a city slicker. Boy Willie's out here trying to buy land in the South during the Depression, and that's a whole different ball game. Dutton's been on a winning streak lately, and not just in his career. He tied the knot recently with actress Debbie Morgan from ABC's All My Children. Alongside his theater work, he's been keeping busy with TV and movie gigs, including Crocodile Dundee 2 and Sidney Lumet's upcoming Q&A. Despite his success, he stays grounded. I don't see myself as anything special, he shrugged. I can't swing a hammer or fix a toilet. Acting just happened to be my thing. Dutton doesn't hold back when it comes to his feelings about theater. He describes it as a love-hate relationship. He's seen the inner workings of regional theaters, where actors, sometimes with big names, endure mistreatment just to hold on to the illusion that they're somebody. I don't really enjoy theater, he admits, except maybe when I'm not in it. He's learned that once you move past the idealism of grad school, the reality hits hard. But despite the challenges, he considers himself fortunate to be part of a talented group of individuals. Uh, no, I, I don't really, I, I have a love-hate relationship, relationship with directing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really like it that much. You know, I, I do it when I get a project I'm really passionate about or an idea. In many respects, Dutton might have seemed like an unexpected pick to direct The Corner. While he boasts an impressive acting resume with numerous movie credits under his belt, his directing experience was relatively limited with just one major credit to his name, a 1997 drama for HBO called First Time Felon, which didn't leave a lasting impression. Take advice, Lord. Shut up. You're in the right room now, and you're going to need this here. They tell me they had you over in the disciples' room. However, HBO was familiar with Dutton's work, having collaborated with him on Rock, 
a series produced for the Fox network. Moreover, Dutton shared a significant connection to Baltimore through David Simon, the co-author and co-executive producer of The Corner. This connection likely played a pivotal role in HBO's decision to entrust Dutton with the directorial reins of the groundbreaking series. I knew his history, said Simon, who also wrote the book on which the TV series Homicide, Life on the Street, was based. I knew a lot of what we'd be explaining was going to be second nature for someone from East Baltimore who'd been through what he's been through, and I knew he could pull performances out of a young cast. This is an actor's actor. Initially, Dutton was apprehensive about taking on the directorial role. He had acting commitments lined up, and the idea of committing to a demanding 60-day shoot was daunting. HBO even considered using three directors instead of one due to his hesitations. However, Dutton's perspective changed when he immersed himself in the script written by Simon and Mills. The script deeply resonated with Dutton because it portrayed the struggles of de addicts with compassion and raised significant societal questions. HBO's plan to use the series as a platform to address the urgent issue of de addiction, particularly during an election year, struck a chord with Dutton. It sparked his political consciousness and motivated him to become actively involved. I know how hard it is out there. I know how hopeless it feels, the epidemic of drugs, the lack of jobs, the deprivation and in our community. Dutton instructed the actors to embody the essence of their characters rather than merely portraying their de-use. The resulting work almost resembles a documentary, delving into the intricate dynamics of poverty, illness, and the human condition. The authenticity is further heightened by Dutton's off-camera interviews with key characters at the start and end of each episode. Furthermore, Dutton skillfully captures the pervasive sense of impending chaos that permeates the narrative. Alongside vivid depictions of de-use, the series includes visceral scenes of violence, including beatings, stabbings, and a tense shootout in the streets, where even a horse pulling a fruit stand becomes a victim of unchecked rage amidst indifferent onlookers. Pretty much relevant to Dutton's nature? It's not pretty, nor does it seem particularly commercial. This is a story about people whom no one wants to think about anymore. Petty criminals, de-addicts, the poorest of the poor, acknowledges David Mills. Yet we think we made a show that people haven't seen before, from a perspective that you don't see on television. But the impact on Dutton's image? Did this justify that? Dutton's perspective on the ravages of DA in his hometown reflects a significant evolution in his beliefs. Once aligned with leftist revolutionary ideologies, he now espouses a blend of racial ideology and conservatism. And isn't the industry's situation also similar to this? He views the current state of the industry as an enduring legacy of slavery and racism, one that he believes will persist indefinitely. It's simply G, he states bluntly. Unless we legalize H and C for documented addicts and eliminate the profit motive, I don't foresee any meaningful change. Moreover, Dutton dismisses the idea of expecting aid from the elites, advocating for self-reliance within the African-American community. He argues that with a collective annual spending power of billions of dollars, there's no excuse for not addressing their own financial and social issues independently. That's it for today. See you in the next video. Until then, goodbye.